It's a real pleasure um, to be able to uh, welcome uh, Professor Paul Friedman uh, here today. Um, Paul is a historian and medievalist. Uh, he uh, got his PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley, and spent uh, many years teaching at the University of Vanderbilt before he took up the Chester D. Tripp Professor uh, Chair in History at Yale, where he uh, currently is. Um, his early work focused on social history and also the history of the peasantry. And he has worked particularly in Catalonia, although uh, other bits of his intellectual projects have been throughout Europe and indeed the Americas, as I'll talk about in a moment. Um, he published uh, The Diocese of Vic, uh, Tradition and Regeneration in Medieval Catalonia in 1983, and then went on to publish The Origins of Peasant Servitude in Medieval Catalonia in 1991. Following that, Images of the Medieval Peasants in 1999. But latterly, he has focused on the study of food. Um, this is evidenced by uh, the edited volume, Food, the History of Taste, published in 2007, uh, a volume published in 2008 called uh, Out of the East, Spices, in, and the Midi Sorry, Spices and the Medieval Imagination, uh, and then subsequently two books that focus on, on America, um, the first one being Ten Restaurants That Changed America, published in 2016, and finally American Cuisine and How It Got That Way. Uh, it's a thriller. Um, 2019. Um, his most recent book is Why Food Matters. Um, and that's the book that he'll be talking from today. Okay, his lecture will be about 40 minutes, uh, followed by Q&A, so um, be thinking of questions that you can pose. Um, the, the talk is brought to you by the Exeter Food Network, which brings together researchers interested in food from across the university, across disciplines, across campuses, and so on. If you're interested uh, and not already subscribing to our, uh, our um, newsletter, um, you can uh, find the, the address to do so on one of these brochures. If you want one of these brochures to give to uh, a friend or a colleague, um, do, do come and take some, okay? So, um, over to you, Paul. Thank you so much, Harry. I'm very grateful to the um, Exeter Food Research Network and uh, to Harry West for uh, this invitation, which was originally for March of um, uh, this year and postponed because of the uncertain transportation situation. So my topic, Why Food Matters, is indeed the title of this short book. Um, Yale University Press asked me to put together something on food for a series called Why X Matters. Uh, so, you know, why sculpture matters, why translation matters, why architecture matters. So for this audience, I don't need to labor at convincing you that food is a worthwhile, even vital academic topic. But one still has to justify this as amounting to more than a fun or leisure subject, apart from issues of biological survival. So if you, know, you don't have to judge it, uh, uh, justify it to yourself, uh, I'm sure you have colleagues or fellow students or others who somehow think food studies is non-serious. So I'm not really... Uh, out to give you ammunition for a battle you may or may not have to fight. But I'd like to put into context some of the ways in which universities in the Anglo-American world have uh, focused on food or been unable to or done in certain ways uh, and not the others. This somewhat annoying need to explain the validity of the subject um, is part of academic politics, but also of ordinary perception. I, I teach an undergraduate course on the history of food and cuisine uh, at Yale. And when I ask students what their parents think about their taking such a course, they laugh and uh, roll their eyes. Unlike most of the other titles in this Yale 
Why X Matters series. Uh, the question implied by my title has an obvious answer. We can't live without food. The point of the enterprise, however, is to look at wider implications. Since unlike some other necessarily bodily functions, such as sleep, um, uh, uh, food um, has a um, cultural as well as physiological importance. As an historian, I'm primarily interested in how food has affected geopolitical shifts and how people in the past and in the present use food as a matter of identity to contrast themselves with outsiders. But in considering the implications of how we acquire and consume food, one must consider environmental, sustainability, climate issues. There's an enduring tradition in Western thought that beyond its merely biological importance, food does not matter. That is, it is not an intellectual subject. It's pleasant to have regular meals, according to the predominant view, what, but what you eat is essentially not worth further consideration. David Mamet's play from 1984, Glengarry Glen Ross, uh, has the shady real estate salesman Richard Roma expressing a common opinion when he says, who cares about meals? It's only food. The shit we put in keeps us going. It's only food. A more learned skepticism about food as a serious topic uh, is exemplified by Michel de Montaigne, who recalled an amusing conversation he had with a chef um, uh, for his patron, uh, 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 Cardinal Carafa, who curiously enough regarded his job with gravity. The cook lectured the philosopher on what he referred to pompously as the science of eating, affecting, quote, a grave and magisterial countenance, as if he were discussing great points of theology, unquote. Montaigne found it laughable that a mere artisan of the kitchen could describe salads and roast meat as if they merited high seriousness. His discourse, as Montaigne described it, bloated with grand and magnificent words, such as one might use in describing the government of an empire. 400 years after Montaigne's remark, the distinguished chef Jacques Pepin, in his youth, experienced a more consequential dismissal of cuisine as a worthy subject of inquiry, in this case pronounced by a professor of French literature. Uh, Pepin was already a chef. He had been chef for the president of uh, France in the mid-1950s. And then he came to the United States uh, where he worked, but he also received a bachelor's degree at Columbia University. And he wanted to continue to study French literature at the graduate level and was indeed admitted to the PhD program, but left when his advisor responded to his proposal to write about food in French literature with the um, statement that this was out of the question. Quote, the reason not much has been written on the topic, Monsieur Papin, is that cuisine is not a serious art form. He went on, it is far too trivial for academic study, and it's not intellectual enough to form the basis of a PhD thesis. Within the European and North American cultural areas, cuisine has not been considered comparable to performing arts, such as opera, or academic subjects, such as philosophy. Recipes and dining out attract popular interest in discussion, but so do many other diversions, after all, from fashion to hang gliding. The fundamental distinction seems to be between what the French refer to as alimentation on the one hand and cuisine on the other. This is particularly true within the discipline of history. Under the first heading are indisputably significant areas of research having to do with survival, diet, efficiency, and nutrition, whereas cuisine denotes whatever is a matter of preference, uh, that cheese is popular in France, uh, but not in China or that Americans like peanut butter, while most of the rest of the world does not. Within the discipline of history, subjects related to alimentation received an increased amount of attention with the advent of social history, as with the Annals School. What the diet of peasants was, 
what the effects of various famines were. Uh, school lunch programs in the 20th century, price fluctuations for food products, all of these have been widely studied uh, for uh, decades. And their importance has not been questioned. What was served at Renaissance banquets, on the other hand, or the rise of curry in the UK, uh, would be uh, widely considered, at least for a long time, topics for amateurs part of what used to be referred to as boudoir history, along with furniture, or the mistresses of Louis XIV, or clothing, or other daily ephemera. Culinary history has, of course, benefited in recent decades from uh, the influence of anthropology on history. And since my host is an anthropologist, uh, uh, I can't go without saying that if it weren't for anthropology, I think um, uh, history would never have absorbed uh, an interest in food as um, a set of cultural symbols or of uh, status or of hierarchy. The fact that the single most influential discipline on history in the last 50 years has been anthropology is um, uh, in substantial measure uh, the reason for the development of cuisine as a respectable academic topic. Um, another influence, I mean, there are two other ones that I think are paramount. One is an interest in material culture, in the artifacts of everyday life, seen not so much as a history of elite fashion, but of the physical environment, adaptations to it, uh, and the um, uh, uh, shifts in standards of living. Uh, another is women's history. Uh, it's not that uh, women are necessarily associated with preparing food, although practically speaking it has in the Western world worked out that way. Um, and here too, this has been ambivalently accepted. So uh, a great historian of cookbooks Barbara Ketchum Wheaton, who among other things uh, um, sort of created a database of uh, uh, modern cuisine, was, the, um, uh, was employed by the Schlesinger Library at uh, Harvard University. So the Schlesinger Library, as many of you know, is uh, part of Radcliffe, which used to be the women's college when Harvard uh, and Radcliffe were sister schools, but not the same institution. And it is devoted to the study, to women's studies. It has a tremendous cookbook collection. Uh, why, I'm not sure I remember, but it sort of had this from the beginning. And uh, Barbara was told uh, when she uh, took over not to add to this collection, not to uh, fuss about it, you know, if people wanted to see books that they had, that was fine. But they were not proud of possessing these cookbooks, which were sort of symbols of a subjugation that the people running the library, this would be the early 1980s, were not particularly interested in um, drawing attention to. Whether associated then with drudgery or with frivolity, cuisine still has to justify itself as a legitimate historical topic. And one of the things that motivated me to study food history was that as an historian of the Middle Ages, I knew that seemingly frivolous commodities have extraordinary historical effects. Um, the reason I was interested in writing a book about spices uh, that Harry referred to, um, and not just the spice trade, which has been written about a lot, but the demand for spices was um, because here's something that people do not need uh, that is a luxury product. Uh, the infatuation for spices was a largely upper class phenomenon that then spread uh, fairly um, widely so that even peasants are eating food spiced with pepper by the late Middle Ages. But nevertheless, people can live without spices and have done so. And yet, uh, of course, 
the uh, voyages uh, that resulted in European colonization of much of the rest of the world were in part motivated by an effort to figure out how to get spices directly from India without having to go through Muslim intermediaries. So um, I, I, I think probably most of you know, but I can't resist the uh, repeating the spices were not used to cover up the taste of spoiled meat, uh, nor were they used to preserve meat. There are much better ways, uh, uh, traditional ways, and much cheaper ways, salt, or pickling, or drying, or smoking. Uh, spices were luxury products. They were prized for their aromatic taste and smell. Uh, they were credited with medicinal power. And uh, they were also flavorings for food. One has to just face it that in the Middle Ages, people liked a much spicier cuisine than was true in Europe until very recently, from about the 17th, uh, 18th century. Spices were either exiled to desserts or sweets. Um, or just gotten rid of. So there are all sorts of spices mentioned, for example, in Chaucer that are now unknown, except maybe in Thai restaurants and even there, uh, um, not really uh, household names. So unlike supplies of grain, meat, or fish, this is not a strategic item, but rather an ornamental one. Nevertheless, um, uh, Unnecessary tastes move nations. The um, uh, historian uh, Henry Hobhouse observed, the starting point for European expansion had nothing to do with the rise of any religion or the rise of capitalism even, but it had a great deal to do with pepper. Pepper and other spices were desired with sufficient passion and traded at prices high enough to make it worthwhile to launch these expeditions uh, um, of da Gama, Columbus, and so forth to find India, uh, which da Gama did, and Columbus uh, obviously found something else. In Calicut, when da Gama's uh, ship uh, landed, one of his crew was accosted by a North African Muslim trader who asked in Spanish, their common language, what ill wind drew you here? And the Portuguese sailor allegedly responded, we have come for Christians and spices. And you know that sums it up. The earliest phase of um, European colonialism combines at least a religious um, uh, earnestness or uh, market, market study, let's say, with a commodities-driven project. The high-end medieval taste for putting spices in everything ended with the advent of modern European cuisine, uh, which begins in France. About 1700, except for pepper, spices were, as I said, either um, put in the category of dessert ingredients, things like cinnamon, or, um, or, or gotten rid of altogether, like long pepper or zedoary or galanga. So whereas in the Middle Ages, they would sprinkle cinnamon and sugar on pasta uh, and fish, uh, that's uh, rejected. And rejected in interesting terms in 17th century France. Um, either it's childish uh, or Arab. The Arab part is, uh, in its uh, insulting way, accurate. Certainly, the uh, presence of spices, such as cinnamon, remains a part of savory dishes, uh, as well as sweet ones, in, the, um, in North Africa and the Middle East. Um, uh, childish because of the sugar, I guess, or simply the violation of rules of uh, appropriate mixture. And of course, the creation of such rules is a product of a particular campaign uh, of basically authenticity and simplicity, that um, the Middle Ages was despised for devising sauces that covered up the true ingredients. And so the reformers, as they saw themselves in the late 17th and 18th century, were trying to 
uh, make sure that things tasted of what their essential ingredients were, and right? that those ingredients, even such, something as humble as cabbage, should be of the finest quality. The declining importance of spices is sort of dramatically demonstrated by the 1664 exchange of the Dutch uh, island of Manhattan for the British occupied island of Run in the Banda Archipelago in eastern uh, Indonesia, as it now is, in the Maluka Islands. So the island of Run was a nutmeg island, and it was more or less of equal value in 1664 to Manhattan. Obviously, the subsequent period has seen a rather widening gap between uh, the, uh, you know, at least real estate value of these two places. The most dramatic example, and again, in this audience, I don't have to insist on this, the most dramatic example of a frivolous commodity with tremendous historical implications is sugar. By contrast with the decline of spices, beginning in the 17th century, sugar became exponentially more popular. For England, for example, at the beginning of the 18th century, four pounds per capita was the consumption. Uh, 18 pounds at the beginning of the 19th century, and 60 pounds uh, at the beginning of the 20th. And, and now it's over 150 uh, pounds of sugar per year. Uh, I'm not sure where the UK's uh, tremendous consumption is concentrated. In the United States, an awful lot of it comes from, not from candy, cakes, or dessert, uh, but rather um, from things that people don't realize have sugar. Uh, barbecue sauce, bottled salad dressings, um, and certainly in the United States, soda uh, are uh, incredibly important. And then, of course, as I think uh, we all know, processed foods and just regular old commodities like bread uh, in the sort of supermarket form have uh, a, a tremendous amount of sugar. Sugar is no more a biological necessity than our spices. Uh, from Han China to the Roman Empire, great civilizations managed perfectly well without it. Um, yeah, I mean, honey, which I don't happen to really like all that much. I mean, I appreciate it as an aesthetic. Um, but um, I suppose I'm glad not to have to rely on it completely. So again, I, you know, I, um, I realize that members of this group are largely aware of some of this, but um, the connection between sugar and slavery was obvious even to contemporaries. According to James Fox, a vigorous opponent of slavery, among other things, uh, writing in 1791, every cup of tea or any other beverage sweetened with sugar is, quote, steeped in the blood of our fellow creatures, unquote. In Voltaire's Candide, the itinerant protagonist, uh, while in the West Indies, talks to a black slave stretched out on the ground who is missing a hand and a leg. And the unfortunate man tells the relentlessly optimistic youth that having lost a finger in the sugar refining machinery, his whole hand was cut off as a punishment for his carelessness. And then his attempt to run away was punished by having a leg amputated. Summing up his treatment, the slave says, this is the price that must be paid so that you can have sugar in Europe. European demand created immense profits for the cultivation, refining, shipping, and distribution of sugar. The great surge in consumption began when sugar was added to three newly fashionable caffeinated beverages, tea, coffee, and chocolate, none of which had required sugar in their uh, original sites. The Chinese to this day don't uh, uh, have sugar with tea, generally. Coffee in Arabia was not originally sweetened. Uh, the Mesoamerican elite didn't have sugar at all and drank chocolate with hot peppers and uh, fragrant flowers. So the uh, vagaries of taste led Europeans to prefer sweet, hot beverages, um, preferably accompanied by more sugar in the form of pastries, cookies, and biscuits. In 18th century Spain, for example, it was uh, 
uh, required to serve hot chocolate with melindros, which are long biscuits with a spongy texture. texture. And these la later gave way to churros, uh, strips of fried dough rolled in sugar. Now chocolate and churros are kind of like thought of as um, inevitable companions. The European predilection for sugar moved people around the globe with catastrophic results. And cultural exchange with regard to food then means more than just transporting a food practice, but also borrowing it and shaping it, and sometimes at great cost. So despite popular and learned dismissal, food has meaning beyond its biological aspects. It forms memories that constitute a sense of who we are for example. Most people retain exactly and fondly the delightful taste and ambiance of special past meals. Uh, Jacques Pepin's professor notwithstanding, literary writers, uh, uh, literary figures do write about food, and certain instances, such as Proust Madeleine, are, of course, renowned. Enjoyment far from fading away, endures in our minds as entrancing and comforting. The pandemic accentuated the power of food to evoke loss and yet also consolation to preserve sanity. Uh, the involuntary displacement, confinement, and memory um, uh, uh, reinforce symbolic as well as biological uh, significance of food. Accounts of disruption, exile, um, uh, family problems, aging, uh, evoke poignant culinary recollection very frequently. An incomparably agonizing example of the power of food in memory is a cookbook put together by Jewish women imprisoned in the Theresienstadt concentration camp during the Nazi hegemony. Obviously, no one arrived there with a collection of home recipes, nor would it have been possible to find or prepare the dishes that were remembered for this cookbook, uh, put together in a situation of near starvation. As recounted in a work entitled In Memory's Kitchen by Cara da Silva, the recipes were based on the women's remembering of the comforting everyday uh, food of home. Theresienstadt held inmates who were supposedly privileged. At least at first, they were kept in a camp falsely presented to the world as a model um, Jewish settlement. Uh, there is an infamous movie called uh, uh, The Führer uh, Gives the Jews a City. Um, that was part of this propaganda. But um, uh, it eventually uh, became just a way station to Auschwitz as the war uh, ground on, and as the Nazis uh, gave up that pretense. In the face of attempts to obliterate and dehumanize, the cookbook reaffirmed the women of Theresienstadt's integrity. Recalling specific foods and how to prepare them constituted a form of psychological resistance and self-preservation. The cookbook is a harrowing document, epitomizing the significance of food for both cultural as well as biological uh, survival. Uh, tragically, the uh, author of the, you know, the introduction and the contextualization of the cookbook, Cara de Silva, uh, told me that the recipes tend not to work, uh, uh, that they have way too much butter and sugar, for example. So, uh, uh, you know, among ourselves, we can agree that food matters. A lot of what interested me in writing this book uh, as I think motivates uh, many of you who are st students of this subject, is um, how food serves to define and reinforce group identities and uh, distinctions. I was interested in putting together some chapters on how food symbolically divides populations according to considerations such as class, for example, that medieval peasants lived on gruel, ale, salt, pork, while the aristocracy required game, spices, and wine. Or gender, how women were supposed to have a particular fondness for sugary things, like cake or ice cream, 
but their reputation for preferring light food is much more recent, things like salads. Or race, the simultaneous white contempt for what African Americans liked, um, simultaneous with imitation or borrowing from their cuisine for what became typified as American specialties, such as barbecue chicken, uh, barbecue, fried chicken, or gumbo. But rather than run through a synopsis of this uh, book's contents, in the time remaining, I, I thought I might look at how food brings people together and is symbolic but vitally significant in community building functions. Uh, so more cheerful, I guess, than the uh, divisions. The word commensality means having meals in company. And while it seems like academic jargon, it is actually a venerable, if pedantic term, attested to since the 17th century. Defined by Samuel Johnson as, uh, quote, fellowship of the table, the custom of eating together, unquote. In 1826, writing about members of the House of Commons being invited to dine with the speaker, an observer Imagine, Dr. Johnson remarked, eating together promotes goodwill, sir. As you know, everything he says either begins or ends with the word sir. Commensality, he continues, is benevolent. As with many things having to do with food, commensality is so common that it has tended to pass unnoticed. One might say we've been practicing commensality without being aware of it. Among most people's happiest memories are gustatory celebrations, life-affirming expressions of family and community solidarity, accompanying such things as marriages, anniversaries, school graduations, uh, and the like. Um, in the Dutch movie of the 1990s, Antonia's Line, um, the life of the eponymous protagonist is punctuated by uh, meals with neighbors and relatives eaten almost always outdoors at a long table. And these are clearly among the happiest moments of her uh, uh, life. The plot is as much about the difficulties of her existence as about its festive aspects, but the festive aspects are marked particularly by commensality. The Prophet Muhammad praised commensality. Eat together and do not separate. Blessing is in society. The 11th of the 12th Shiite Imams is supposed to have said that when you sit at table with your brothers, sit long, for it is a time that is not counted against you as part of your lives. I'm, I'm fascinated uh, by various cultures' um, decisions about what activities don't count to your uh, mortality various kinds of prayers or devotions in the medieval Christian world were supposed to not be on the tally of how much time you had on earth. Commensality represents religious ceremony as well as worldly togetherness. In, uh, to pay tribute to anthropology once more, in The Religion of Java, Clifford Geertz's monumental classic of 1960, the Slamaton, a short ceremonial meal is the center of Javanese life. And if I recall correctly, the book begins with the Slamatan. This is a carefully structured, short ceremonial meal, an understated but solemn response to events, favorable or unfavorable, such as moving to a new house or the death of a loved one. And typical of Java, at a slamaton, nothing of substance is mentioned relating to what is being commemorated. No toasts, no anecdotes about the deceased, if it's that. Uh, no uh, tips for decorating the house, if it's that. Um, random and trivial conversation. It's the eating together that by itself creates a a ritual bond. The food for the slamatan is special. It's prepared by women and consumed by men. Uh, the men sit on the floor, uh, eating with the fingers of their right hand and using banana leaves as plates. At least this is my memory of uh, living in Java for six months, uh, admittedly a long time ago. 
Um, and I did participate in Islamatan when the, women of the, the woman of the family I was living with had a miscarriage. And it was very poignant. It was very poignant, um, even distressing, that uh, this was celebrated by me, uh, a foreigner, and other men. Uh, the woman herself was simply one of the people who prepared the food. And uh, uh, you know, no mention was made of this event. Contemporary Western celebrations of life take place, of you know, big events take place with more ostentation than in a slamaton. Uh, and this has gotten crazy. I don't know if it's the case here, but I weep for my students when they graduate because they have a round of obligatory destination weddings to attend that are both very time consuming, very tedious, and financially ruinous. Right? Oh, yeah, when you get there to um, uh, Morocco or Tahiti, your expenses will all be paid. But obviously, getting there is not uh, is, is at your own expense, usually. Um, but school graduation parties, major birthdays, uh, these have become more and more elaborate, including the catering. And ordinary family meals, by contrast, have fallen apart in recent decades. This is a failure of everyday commensality, widely regretted um, but considered inevitable. The former routine of sitting down together to exchange news is recalled with wistful nostalgia, a relic of an analog world uh, associated with typewriters, vinyl records, and uh, uh, what I believe uh, is called appointment TV. As meals have become hurried and utilitarian, social commentators have lamented the waning of commensality, linking it to a general crisis of community and public engagement. But actually, I would say that group dining has not been extinguished. After all, uh, restaurants are immensely popular. Socializing over meals with friends is um, more common around the world than ever. And this is not only because of some kind of foodie wave, but because commensality creates, confirms, and extends relationships. Conversation at the table tells you about the other person, uh, which is why the first instinct in wanting to get to know someone better is to share a meal. Hollywood is aware of the relation between commensality and personality. Um, the 1990s movies, I, I, I don't know why I'm fixated in the 1990s, but uh, Pretty Woman and Twister are examples that show a lot about the characters, although the films are not about food. And they're not like Big Night or Tampopo or Babette's Feast from the same era. Uh, according to Fabio Paraseculi, who did a study of blockbuster movies defined by you know, gross income, I think he had about 150 of them. All but one had some scene in which people are eating. Uh, I think the exception was one of the Star Wars movies. Uh, in, in Pretty Woman, as you may or may not remember, there's a scene with this horribly obnoxious uh, executive in which um, Julia Roberts tries to eat snails with, uh, and extract the snails, holding them with a forceps. And this meal is intended by this guy as a humiliation, not for her, but for some business rival who uh, is, in fact, is so insulted that he gets up, whereupon the meal completely ends. Uh, in Twister, uh, Twister is about tornado chasers in like Oklahoma or somewhere like that. Uh, people who give weather reports on the progress of tornadoes at great personal danger, but with a lot of adventure. And the gimmick in the movie is that the best chaser in this particular group is female. But in a scene in which what normally would be the men sitting around and trading stories while their wives prepare a meal, um, this woman's role is somewhat ambiguous because the wives don't want to have any part of her because uh, uh, she's kind of uh, an outlier or a, uh, a marginal figure uh, uh, who, who can't be part of their 
community. And the men, I mean, they accept her, but they're, they're, uh, this is part of their being intimidated by her anyway. So um, commensality does not necessarily reinforce benevolence, actually, uh, the imagined Samuel Johnson uh, uh, to the contrary. Sharing and festivity can produce not only tension, but often dramatic conflict. Fights during meals feature in novels and dramas, as, for example, the violent altercation over Irish politics at Christmas dinner in Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Uh, mundane, non-celebratory collations can degenerate as well. In Jonathan Francis, The Corrections, there's a harrowing description of a boy refusing to eat his mashed rutabagas, Swedes, I think, in uh, Britain, and being kept at the table for hours by his parents as he maintains his stubborn defiance. Uh, the Red Wedding from uh, Game of Thrones. In the modern world, restaurants are the venue of choice for social mingling, and they stand between the privacy of the family and the anonymity of cities. Their purpose is to serve food, but of course, restaurants also encourage relationships, profiting by offering a place to talk with social, intellectual, or business associates. And uh, what I want to sort of end with is some examples of restaurant commensality. Uh, four kinds, romance, friendship, celebration, and business. So romance, um, a few uh, American examples, since I know those best. Um, ways of getting to know potential intimate partners uh, range from arranged marriages to uh, mixers. These were dances that were a feature of my uh, unfortunate youth. Or from 1970s fern bars. Uh, to online dating sites. In classical and medieval literature, couples do not tend to develop relationships over meals. Dante, at the circle of the lustful in hell, is told by Paola and Francesca, not that they, they fell in love at some, you know, um, uh, uh, taverna, but rather while reading chivalric romances together. Tristan and Isolde were fatally attracted through a potion administered by mistake. In Jane Austen's era, promising matches might be encouraged by strategic seating at meals, but gatherings such as balls and chaperone visits were the occasions for courtship. So romance at restaurants requires sufficient relaxation of social rules to allow a young woman to be alone with a young man. And in Northern Europe and the United States, this started to happen in the late 19th century. In William Dean Howell's novel, A Modern Instance of 1882, uh, which is set in Boston, Bartley Hubbard impresses the naive Marcia Gaylord with his ability to maneuver in a high social setting, nonchalantly ordering dinner in the dining room of Boston's Revere House Hotel and displaying uh, what the author calls a dazzling intelligence with regard to selection from a menu that was in French. Restaurants are not sites for initiating relationships, but rather for following up an initial encounter. For a long time, dinner together was one of the first things a couple experienced in their early acquaintance, a recognized stage in the process of intimacy. And many people will remember uh, the first meal with their future partner, uh, sometimes with affection and sometimes as a comedic uh, um, uh, event. If we go from romance to meals among friends, these involve a wider range of dining contexts. So in many, many American small towns, circles of older men often meet for breakfast uh, at a McDonald's or a cafe or a donut place to share news, uh, to tell stories that they've all heard before, uh, to make random observations. And friendship is the opposite of courting, because the point of getting together is not finding out about someone you've just connected with, but rather going over the same ground with characters often you've known for years. And why that is a consolation or a pleasure 
is actually rather hard to describe. Um, I suppose reassurance, as in repetition of certain things and routine, are comforting. Camaraderie of this sort also used to characterize adolescent socializing as well. Again, I'm speaking about the United States. The 1982 movie Diner is set in Baltimore in 1959, and it centers around a group of male friends who have graduated from high school and are about to scatter and take on different life roles. They eat together frequently at a diner to discuss their often uncomfortable encounters with girls, but often without quite realizing it to uh, create memories that will withstand their in imminent dispersal. A similar setting here involving both young men and women is the burger stand in the movie uh, American Graffiti from 1973, which is another look back at a lost world. But in the 21st century, food has declined as a means to advance friendship. Um, obviously, a lot of millennial and Gen Z life is conducted online. A third well-known amicable meal type is what's covered by the dismissive term, Ladies Who Lunch, which is originally a song from the musical company uh, from 1970. Modern female commensality in the United States goes back to just after the Civil War, which was the first time that middle class women were permitted by social custom to have lunch in groups, all female groups, at restaurants. Initially, they were limited to private rooms. But later, meaning after 1900 or so, uh, in gracious but inexpensive places specifically designed for female customers. These places did not prohibit men, but discouraged men by having no alcohol and by becoming known as ladies' uh, destinations. They attracted um, two kinds of women primarily, uh, women who didn't work but who were shopping, and women who worked in retail and clerical jobs um, and who would take lunch outside their office or uh, store. So unlike the above-mentioned male cronies, breakfast cronies who tend to be elderly, uh, these women could be any age, uh, any adult age. Um, and partly because many women did not have a fixed work schedule, but also sociologically, because American women tend then and now to value friendship more than men of the professional and executive ranks who are socialized uh, to think that friendship is either uh, utilitarian or a waste of time. From friendship to festive events, celebrations of the oldest but best attested form of group dining. Roman banquets, Native American potlatches are, of course, great collective feasts. Our society makes a point of observing family-oriented occasions, such as anniversaries or birthdays. Uh, feasts can be an uh, affirmation of social solidarity. Clubs, religious fellowships, guilds, and professional associations have at uh, various times um, cemented common interests through celebratory dining. They also reinforce hierarchy, however, with degrees of privilege uh, visible about who stands and who sits, uh, who sits where at the table, what they are served. In both cohesive and hierarchical settings, banquets reaffirm a group and the relationships within that uh, circle. And finally, meals provide business, professional, and political occasions to talk face to face about sometimes vitally important affairs. Winston Churchill, for example, carefully planned the dinners he gave for political allies and rivals, including the meetings at Yalta and Potsdam with Stalin, uh, Roosevelt, and Truman. In 1791, at the beginning of the French Revolutionary Terror, uh, a restaurant called Mayo, uh, whose menu, uh, held by the Banneke Library at Yale, shows more than 250 choices was a gathering place for judges and members of the Revolutionary Tribunal, particularly Danton and Robespierre, who over dinner, and we don't know what they ordered, but over dinner would draw up a list of the people to be guillotined in the next few days. To use a restaurant to devise less bloodthirsty schemes, to make contacts and connections, to do business, you need to take meals there repeatedly and predictably. 
proving you are in the game. Uh, the African-American politician Al Sharpton said of Sylvia's, a restaurant in Harlem, you had to show up from time to time or else people thought you had retired. High society has always functioned this way. To be a favorite uh, uh, aristocrat in the reign of Louis XIV required attending the court of Versailles. No matter how nice your provincial chateau, you were nobody if you were not seen at this central place. Um, the restaurant, however, reflects the situation of the upper bourgeoisie in the 19th century, people whose status was in wealth and not birth, titles or land. They might have a level of entertainment that rivaled the opulence of the aristocratic courts, but um, uh, public notice was important to them. Most business people want discretion and clubbiness at their favorite restaurants, but they also want exposure. And the restaurant needs to provide an audience for them. One of the restaurants that I studied in a, a book on American restaurants uh, called The Four Seasons became famous for the so-called power lunch. And the idea of this is that uh, you have regulars who um, their table is so regular that they um, cancel their reservation if they're not going to show up rather than make the reservation. And everybody knows who they are, where they are seated is very important. Um, the lunch often was rather routine because by this time, this is the late 70s and the 80s, um, it was fashionable to eat rather abstemiously. So this is uh, a, not an opulent, uh, uh, elegant lunch, but rather a demonstration of your power. So actually, today, successful people in most fields no longer require lunch as a transactional opportunity. It takes too much time. Uh, LinkedIn or networking events uh, appear more efficient than midday dining. So in 1991, a book appeared about Los Angeles called You'll Never Eat Lunch in This Town Again. And this now seems like a period piece about the movie industry because People in that industry, you know, lunch is not a big deal anymore. Uh, I, I, I wonder in what areas, uh, so lunch used to be a very important thing for faculty in universities. And I think it's not dead, but it's certainly a shadow of its former self. The book publishing industry, still uh, authors, writers, I mean authors, publishers, and agents, uh, at least in New York, still do a lot of dining out. And one can identify the restaurants that they go to, and even identify what kind of author, publisher, or agent they are by which restaurant they go to. But this is somewhat exceptional. So um, although it's most often life enhancing, commensality is somewhat times comical or uh, tragic. Uh, the sense of food and dining having a meaning and significance, though, is what I want to emphasize, as opposed to the notions that meals are just uh, a biological refueling stop. For you in this uh, uh, audience and in this webinar uh, um, group, I'm not so much interested in proving that food deserves a place in the university curriculum, because you already have it, as to encourage you to think about food as significant in how all of us experience life. That cooking recipes, dining out, celebrations are not just a practical way of getting by, that they are ways of making sense uh, in the uh, world. Culture, of course, is how we organize and regulate experiences according to unwritten but familiar codes. Beyond its physical significance, food is an important uh, marker of orientation. Americans dislike organ meat, a revulsion not shared by most other societies. More significant than such factoids is that uh, what we do and do not like has meaning uh, and that our tastes are not fixed. So I lived in Nashville, Tennessee from 1979 to 1997. And when I moved there, the food was very bland uh, but in that 18-year uh, interim, the arrival of things like Thai restaurants, 
but also the development of non-immigrant uh, uh, foods like, I mean, I hate buffalo chicken wings, but they're spicy. Um, blackened redfish was a thing, also very spicy. So the food became dramatically different in terms of its level of spiciness. There's a book called Spicing Up Britain by Panikos Panayi, uh, which also traces the changes beginning in the 1970s. And I think he's unduly dismissive of everything that came before. He acts as if you know, there was no food. Uh, uh, there was only you know, kind of uh, horrible uh, 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 bare nourishment. He's right to emphasize the growing variety of piquant uh, flavors available, uh, as well as cuisines uh, beginning around them. So food is something whose everydayness and whose ubiquity are made more interesting when examined and questioned. And that's what I hope I've suggested or confirmed to you today at this talk. And thank you very much for coming. And I uh, look forward to your questions and comments. Paul, if I could just um, ask the first question. You know, over the course of your career, you've, you've moved from um, the study of, of uh, you know, the servitude in the peasantry in Catalonia, um, which already has a connection to the, to the foundations of, of, of food through land, right, um, to a more explicit kind of focus on, on uh, what, what the peasantry eats, for example, it, 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 is, is part of that. But ultimately, moving to, toward a focus on cuisine and rising up to a focus on, on you know, the upper classes, uh, um, to, to wealth and power and privilege, what anthropologists refer to as moving from studying down to studying up. I mean, I, I'm interested to hear what, what the consequences of that are um, for you, how, yeah. how you conceive of that shift. I'll stand over here. Yeah, it actually wasn't deliberate, but as I uh, told Harry earlier, I once gave a talk at the Medieval Academy of America, so that's sort of my, my home uh, learned society, and it was on uh, two Catalan cookbooks of the late Middle Ages. And somebody that I know uh, in a public you know, space, in an audience like this, got up and he asked me a regular old question, but then followed it up with, and by the way, whatever happened to the Paul Friedman of the origins of peasant servitude in medieval Catalonia? Which is a way of saying, what happened to you? You were a serious historian at one time. And I gave the response spontaneously. Well, you know, having spent 25 years studying peasants, I thought I'd devote the rest of my career to rich people. Um, that's not exactly true. Uh, but um, I, I'm interested not so much in the wealthy as in choice, where people have a choice of uh, not only foods, but sometimes of vendors or people they're buying food from. And this does not require great wealth. It requires enough surplus to uh, buy something from someone else. And so I've been fascinated by places where you know, there's a street where people prepare the same kind of bread or pastry or something, and yet uh, uh, some are identified as better than others, or there are quarrels that people go over and over on who is better. Uh, or a fish market, I know in Bar part of Barcelona that I uh, know best, um, there are several fish sellers, but there's always a longer line at, uh, at one of them. So that kind of distinction. It's a bit like what you're talking about the medieval spice trade. I'm interested in what role the cook has in translating the influx of spices into a European court cuisine. As you alluded to early on, that cooking and cookery is sort of a, an illegitimate art form. So I was wondering if you could speak of the social role and social perception of cooks during this period. It's a legitimate craft, if illegitimate art form. So uh, there are famous chefs. And the cookbooks that we have from the Middle Ages, and there are about 150 manuscripts, uh, are often by chefs to show uh, sort of you know, what we cook 
at the court of the Duke of Savoy, or what we cook at the court of the King of Naples. Um, towards the end of the Middle Ages, you do start to get something that resembles modern cookbooks in that they're by women, and they're middle class, or affluent, but not noble. Uh, and they seem to be, um, you know, they have more instructions rather than simply, um, uh, you know, saying, uh, take the skin off a swan and then sew it back on, you know, cook it and sew it back on and uh, uh, scatter gold leaf uh, over it or something like that. Um, the, there are celebrity chefs. Uh, the most famous is Taillevent. The um, uh, Guillaume Terrell was his real name, but his, his nickname was Taillevent. And he is, his tomb is, still exists, in, I think, in Alsace. And he was knighted by the king. He was the royal chef of the king of several kings of France. Um, the knighthood is somewhat derisory because his coat of arms are three little stew pots. Uh, on the other hand, he took it seriously enough to have it on his tomb sculpture uh, along with his two wives, one had died, and uh, I think a little dog, and a sword, since he was a knight. So yeah, there are um, uh, 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 artisans, but they're uh, you know, and who are uh, admired, and whose talent it is acknowledged is superior to that of others. So it's not something that just anybody can master. But on the other hand, it's not a, it's not music, um, it's not uh, uh, some kind of fine art. So um, one of the online questions, uh, Timothy Woods asks uh, if you could follow up on food at home and family community. Uh, uh, he says, this seems complicated by multi-professional families and the outsourcing of food for kids to schools, restaurants. We don't have time to cook at home. But so much is lost with food stories around family tables. Uh, can and should it be Recovered, and we have another question that from Harry that also says, "What trends you may see with com commensality emerging in the yeah. future?" Well, so during the pandemic, there were uh, over optimistic predictions that this would result in the rediscovery of cooking at home, and uh, for a while, there was a kind of uh, uh, conversation about this. In the United States, there was a sudden uh, fashion for bread making and other uh, homey uh, practices that uh, have gone back uh, to their niche level uh, after the end of the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of lamentation about it, uh, and, but increasingly vague memories of a before time. Uh, certainly in my family, uh, we always ate at 6 o'clock. My father always managed to come home and have dinner with us. And um, I don't remember it with any particular affection, but it certainly was regular. And that predictability was nice. And um, so it's not only the busyness that has uh, disrupted this, but the customizing, the fact that um, uh, unlike saying, you know, I don't care if you don't like string beans, that's, that's what's for dinner, that uh, young people get to eat what they want, and what they want is almost always not what their parents want. The only difference is the parents who make them prepare it themselves versus the parents who indulge them, serve them at some weird time, and serve them something different. I just wondered if you thought there were any equivalent, modern day equivalents to the sugar uh, yeah. you know, not eating sugar is to, to show you're not supporting the slave trade. So, um, not eating meat springs to mind um, for kind um, of no. You don't no, think there's anything. Interestingly, uh, but I don't study. You know, I don't. Uh, are there abolitionist meals? Did Quakers not eat sugar? It's possible, uh, but I don't. I, I I have the impression not. Of course, the term boycott is old, is it not? So it's, it's possible. But uh, no, as opposed to things like tobacco, which are recognized as, or alcohol, by certain circles, as deleterious. Um, I was hoping uh, you could uh, 
maybe uh, speak a little bit more about the link between history and food. Uh, you mentioned that um, food has re sort of recently entered hi hi history as a discipline, um, and it's definitely become a really big part, uh, history has definitely become a really big part of food today. Um, in nutrition, in diets, we look to history uh, in food products, make historical and traditional claims, and restaurants are also looking backwards to the past. And so about that link, and it's also really interesting what you mentioned about uh, Theresienstadt and the, the way that once you make the recipe, you realize, uh, some, you learn something about history. So yeah, just more about that link. Yeah. Um, again, it depends on which audience you're thinking of. Certainly students of history are interested. Um, I have a good enrollment in a course on the history of food and cuisine. Um, my colleagues, and uh, you know, I'm not complaining, I've been extremely well treated, and, um, uh, but when I retire, they will replace me as a medievalist, but not, uh, not only will they not replace me as a historian of food, but it would not occur to them. It's not like they would say, oh yeah, this is a gap, but we'll, we're gonna uh, prioritize something else. It, it, it's, it's like, uh, and this is a department of 60 people. This is not some you know, small college with a limited faculty. Um, it's simply not uh, necessary. And, and those places that have historians of food, the person either has moved from something else or they're occupying a space such as Renaissance history or um, uh, colonial American history. Um, and a lot of food history is done in other programs. Um, so for example, we have an actual department that's called Ethnicity, Race, and Migration. And there's a food studies and food culture and sort of food history person who's just joined them. So that will be the venue for people, uh, 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 students who are interested in the subject. I mean, to some extent, there's a broader context to that, isn't there? Um, in the, you, so you mentioned clothing earlier in your talk, um, which is another example of a kind of mundane article, right? Um, that, you know, it, it more recently, um, has become an object of study in the social sciences and humanities, and I think we can think of many of those kinds of furniture, for example. Um, th these things are appearing as more as legitimate subjects, but perhaps not fully as, as legitimate subjects. I mean, how does food situate in relation to those? I I'm also curious about the extent to which, you know, they're not only they're not only material objects, mundane material objects, but it's also part of the everyday of the processes. And this in your talk. It's repetitive. It's over and over again rather than grand events. So we, we do seem to see movements in, in the social sciences and humanities toward looking at those things, but maybe they don't ever quite get there. Well, I think, again, the um, alimentation part is very important, and there's a lot of, for example, progress that's been made in early medieval history, understanding the so-called migration of peoples or the Bar what used to be called barbarian invasions that ended the Roman Empire in the West. And with stable isotope analysis of uh, tooth enamel, you can tell where people um, came from, where they spent their youth. And so uh, it turns out that people who look like they were Anglo-Saxon by their grave goods uh, are not. They come from Germany, or they come from Norway, or uh, they're buried with what look like Anglo-Saxon rather than Celtic things, but they're Celts. Uh, um, they never, you know, they never moved very far from uh, uh, the, the the place that they're buried. So um, uh, much of this depends on food, but it's food as a tool of uh, material culture uh, to reconstruct very basic things like who are these people, uh, where are they from. Um, food as an expression of culture. I think where you have some interest is in uh, contemporary controversies. So uh, who owns falafel? 
uh, uh, is a kind of struggle. Um, somewhat less uh, uh, um, uh, fraught, but certainly controversial. Who owns Jollof rice? This is sort of a partly fun competition among Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, but uh, you know could be someday uh, 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 more hostile. Um, but but historians still. I mean, I couldn't tell you more than a very small number of historians of food in the United States, as opposed to people who have sometimes uh, had a topic related to food. Um, they've got to be in some program like gender studies or ethnicity, race, and migration, or African American studies, or even Native American studies, rather than a history department. And, and I think that's partly the peculiar way that American academia operates, uh, but partly the durability of some of the ideas that I was describing. Following up on this point about the different cultural approaches of various academias, what is happening in Italy from an outsider perspective, because I'm not a food historian, is that they seem to be food historians connected with economic history, and particularly in areas where there is private investment of the food industry conglomerates into pushing some sort of academic credibility towards exercise of, you know, invention of tradition of sophisticated marketing. I mean, uh, I don't want to sound catty about that, but I'm thinking of the newfound interest at University of Parma for food studies and gastronomic degrees that are designed mostly as sort of, seems to me as an outsider, how to capitalize on what is a well-known local expertise in producing excellent food and try to make that as research that actually pays its way. Do you have? There's, there's almost no equivalent in the United States. Um, even though there are um, you know, companies that claim and with some degree of legitimacy to make either traditional or artisanal products, um, they prefer to go through regular old advertising. Um, thank you very much, Paul. I'm interested in school food and something you said about um, the commensality of food and sharing food among academics and other um, middle class and rich people has become less and less more common because it's much more time consuming. Um, and that made me think, um, and I wonder what's your take on that, is um, if it's becoming less and less common that people eating together in rich communities, um, what is the future of school food? I mean, as it is now, as we stand, school meals is meant to be a social safety net and is to help children who struggle to have a healthy meal at home to have it in the school. But then, if it's becoming more difficult um, to eat together among adults in academia, in faculties, in, in um, what about children? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, where you would want to observe would be schools, um, not just schools with, uh, uh, with children of all classes. So um, are students in uh, what in America would be high schools um, eating together? Or are they looking at their phones? Uh, I certainly have seen a change in behavior on the train, which I take to work often. So it used to be that um, high school kids, a certain number of private school kids, uh, uh, commute by train. And it would be sort of irritating when they got on because they were boisterous and you know, disruptive even, and loud and laughing and and now, you, you know, you have to look up to see that they're there because they're all uh, on their phones and it's as silent as a library. Um, some of the reason for that is that they're not allowed usually to look at their phones during their time at school. So the train ride 
uh, is, uh, is there uh, time to catch up? But some of it is a change in behavior. I, I would guess that lunch is still pretty uh, companionable. Uh, and seeing college students, uh, more people are eating alone and checking up on their uh, online stuff, but not a majority or not anything near uh, a majority. There's still plenty of boisterousness. And, uh, but, but you know, it would be worth looking here. Um, here you have an awful lot of intermediate spaces uh, with you know, lots and lots of students congregated, but they're not, they're not either dining, I suppose they're studying. And we have the same things, but they're, they're more scattered. Um, and also, it, we don't have as many undergraduates uh, uh, as you do. So yeah, the future is with I think that the predictions of the demise of commensality are exaggerated. And the lost paradise of this, you know, everybody gets together at 6 o'clock and exchanges news about what they had, you know, probably was not a pre-modern practice either, uh, or an industrial revolution practice or even uh, working class families of the 20th century practice uh, where lots of people worked odd hours or the children worked. Um, so some of this is just a notion of a baseline of, say, the post-war era and that everything else is a deviation from a, an imagined normal. Uh, on this incredibly interesting point, what I'm wondering is what you think in terms of the economic incentive for commensality. It struck me that when I was a student in Italy, to eat at the university canteen was a sociability moment, but it was also subsidized. So we could eat at students for around half the price than in a normal issue. Uh, today, academics still eat together in, for example, Oxford and Cambridge, where the college provides food at heavily subsidized rates for academic staff, faculty, and students. Uh, here, I have the choice of a series of commercial overpriced enterprises diffused around. There's no economic incentive to do that. So for me, it becomes a lot more efficient. There's nothing really nice to have, and it's expensive. So I might as well work through. So what I'm wondering is you, as, as an expert of these things, what do you think? Whether this overbearing of the economic element is just the economic historian who media speaks? Or whether well, I, I'm, I would speak not as an expert, but just from my own experience. My university, uh, we can eat anywhere on campus for free as faculty. Nevertheless, most of us do not. Most of us. Uh, don't take advantage of, and the food is very good. I mean, for institutional food, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very good indeed. But why not? Um, you're, you arrive after lunch, or you want to go home before lunch, or uh, you want to get something done, or you agreed to have lunch with a colleague, but you're not going to go to Commons or one of the co residential colleges because, well, because you're going to Well, I, yeah, privacy, uh, uh, it's still institutional. Somehow you're not taking your interlocutor seriously. I always let people suggest, I, I will, you know, I'm glad to go to one of the, so there are 14 residential colleges and they all have a different dining hall and we can dine at any of them uh, for free. Um, most of the time people want to go somewhere else. Because uh, that's where adults go. It's not even privacy. You know, like we're not talking about anything. Uh, uh, sometimes it's noise. The older the colleagues, the worse the noise problem is. Yeah. But then again, you know, restaurants, you know, are not all that quiet either. Uh, but but yeah, the economic incentive is not enough. Um, there's some kind of. Uh, cultural incentive that's necessary. I'm not sure how that would work. So I'm just wondering if, if 
if you can say anything about the significance of having written the book during that context and what, what we learned specifically from it. Yeah, so I'm glad that I resisted the urge to say everything is going to change and here's how it's going to change. Because I was asked sometimes and I thought things really were going to be more dramatic and permanent yeah. uh, than they turned out to be. So I think it still bears the marks of certain expectations uh, and that... Uh, yeah, I mean, except for there being more deli I mean, the pandemic accentuated certain trends, more delivery, uh, more takeout, uh, but it, 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 has, uh, it was expected that there would be radically fewer restaurants, for example, uh, that um, up to one half of them would go out of business. That was the standard kind of prediction. And uh, first of all, that didn't happen. And secondly, let's say 20% went out of business, another 25% have come into business. The, uh, certainly, this is, this is the case all over the United States, and certainly in New York, despite all the adversities. Um, it's, it's hard to explain why, except that, and given that it's uh, by no means a guaranteed moneymaker. Um, some of it has to do with the re-liberalization of immigration uh, and with the opening up of sources of, uh, of labor, a solution to a problem that was thought to have no solution, namely, you know, labor shortage of everybody from dishwashers to waiters to food supply. Um, uh, all of this seems, seems to have gone back to uh, what it was before. The only difference is there's more eating outdoors, uh, even late in the year, but. Uh, today's mention of food constantly features sustainability thought. How has the thought of environment and ecology figured and evolved in historical thinking of food? Certainly, uh, historians consider things like climate change in uh, the past, so in the Roman Empire or in the so-called Little Ice Age of the late Middle Ages. Uh, the um, ways in which people think about things now, uh, again, you know, it's the students who uh, are the most interesting to ask on this because they are the ones who are going to have to face up to the consequences uh, uh, most of all. Um, in my course, although it is listed as history, it's co-listed as environmental studies, uh, although it doesn't have a lot of science in it. But more students are environmental studies majors, as we have, than um, uh, history. You mentioned that previously you were known as the, uh, <coughs> the sort of researcher on sort of peasants and then the shift to, to the wealthier. Within all of this, um, I wonder whether historically the actual um, context of food as an essential life source, how that was perceived from these two different uh, groups, because um, the nuances we've just illustrated here would allude to sort of social status or preference or habits. But what about the fact of people just getting back to a sense of gratitude for the privilege of having the food in the first instance? Yeah, I'm glad to have that as the last question. Um, in the Middle Ages, the aristocracy <clears throat> has as ostentatious and grotesquely ostentatious a dining pattern as any um, in the Victorian period or even now in, um, you know, the restaurants that are on the 50 best list with tasting menus of 30 items. Um, but uh, the medieval and pre-modern upper class were more aware of uh, what now, you know, we want people to know where their food comes from. I mean, they'd seen animals slaughtered. Uh, they saw animals before they were slaughtered. Uh, they uh, were aware of the complexities of supply since they traveled a lot, and um, they would, you know, have, uh, even they would have to be, even the king would have to deal with 
the fact that you know the the butts of wine didn't arrive uh, uh, in the you know, trip from uh, you know Worcester to London or whatever. Um, so uh, the difference now is that not only the rich but everybody, almost everybody, is almost completely unaware of. Uh, where their food comes from, and that creates a anxiety uh, among the thoughtful, or a kind of just blissful ignorance among the non-thoughtful. Uh, gratitude, uh, you know, a lot of people pray, and those prayers specifically mention uh, gratitude for food. Um, the urgency of food still, you know, it's something that you need more than once a day. If there ever came a time in which the sort of 1950s dream of food from pills and, you know, you, you'd just, you'd be satisfied and, and there would be no trouble and there'd be, n you know, none of this uh, uh, tedium of preparation, none of the economic and ecological burden of supplying food. Um, uh, people would think, how did they? How could they live in the past with uh, uh, this unbelievable tedium? And I mean, it's like um, if you teach something like the Middle Ages, you have to get students not to look down on them because you know they didn't have central heating or they didn't uh, they didn't have modern entertainment systems. Nobody woke up in 1350 saying, God, I wish I could watch, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, The Sopranos or something like that. Um, no more than if, for example, uh, we devised some way in which you, your um, urinary and excretory tracts could be evacuated quietly, easily, once a month. Uh, if you read about people's everyday lives and their strategies for, you know, I happen to know where the bathroom is because, uh, you know, that's part of my orientation. And we all, uh, you know, have to take this into consideration when we travel or um, uh, just the tedium of it. Uh, fortunately, most of us don't experience it as, God, I've got to get up in the morning and, and, you know, four or five times today, I'm going to have to figure out uh, uh, this matter. It's simply part of being alive. But there could come a time in which um, I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I I'm, I'm don't regret that I'm not going to see it. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it is, it is possible. Even if the 1950s assumption was that it would be here, certainly by now. Uh, and it most certainly is not. Hi, it sort of touches on the last two questions we've talked about. Um, I'm sort of thinking about climate change and food transform transformations and food system transformations. And I'm just hoping you could touch on um, what history can teach us for looking to the future and imagining a future food system. Um, and maybe particularly drawing on what you're talking about, how tastes aren't fixed um, and how those things can, can change with time. In a way, it would be good if we had never had the food revolution <clears throat> of the 70s and 80s, where taste, at least in the United States and the UK, suddenly mattered more than kind of look, texture, or uh, newness. Because as people are more discriminating about taste than they were, say, 75 years ago, it becomes harder to market things that would be ecologically uh, sustainable. So um, even when I wrote this book, I sort of thought that um, either plant-based meat or meat from lambs would take over. And they haven't done as well as thought. Well, that's because they don't quite taste right. But, you know, in the 19, from 1880 until 1970, uh, both Britain and the United States were taken over by products that were industrial and inferior to their agrarian predecessors, but people didn't care because they, you know, they thought this was modern life, or they were much cheaper, or they were sparkly and you know, kind of uh, uh, um, they came in many different varieties, 
And, you know, so what if they didn't taste like your grandmother's farm? Uh, you know, you weren't living on your grandmother's farm anymore. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think sustainability and um, things that are going to have to happen in the future, it's going to be hard uh, to square with uh, a uh, uh, luxurious enjoyment of, uh, um, you know, this breed of Iberian pigs or, uh, uh, I mean, I hope not. But I think there's a kind of uh, inherent tension. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you all for these great questions. And, uh, uh, Q and A session. We really enjoyed that. So join me in, in thanking Paul. Thank you. Very much.